presentation, feel free to grab it because this is a luncheon. Um, but I want to introduce to you our guest speaker for today, Dr. Marguerite Matthews. Dr. Matthews, PhD, is a 2016-2018 AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Institutes of Health in the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce and Division of Loan Repayment within the Office of Extramural Programs, in the Office of Extramural Research, in the Office of the Director. That's complicated. <laughs> She's very important. As a fellow at NIH, Dr. Matthews is focused on outcome-based research to inform biomedical research, workforce policy, and program evaluation enhancement. She has a strong interest in increasing underrepresented minorities in, STEM, in the STEM workforce and works with various programs aimed at increasing access to opportunities for youth and young adults. Dr. Matthews received a BS in biochemistry from Spelman College and a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pittsburgh, where she characterized the development of the dopamine reward system and an adolescent animal model. She completed her postdoctoral training at Oregon Health and Science University in behavioral neuroscience, studying typical and atypical brain organization in babies and children. And she is our guest speaker today. Um, I'm so excited to have her here as part of the project. Um, and I'm going to turn this time over to her. So a warm welcome to Dr. Matthews. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. Um, even if it's just to grab a bite to eat, um, I appreciate you staying to listen. Um, I'm curious, what are you all here for? What are you hoping to get, be it out of the series, possibly my talk specifically? Anybody want to share what they're hoping to hear about or what they have questions about? I kind of like to get a feel of where folks are before I start speaking because. Um, I want to speak to you, to the audience, um, and not just tell you what I think you want to hear. So, does anybody want to share? Sure. Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, okay. Anybody else? Okay, so who in here is an undergraduate? Okay. And who's in grad school? The rest. And are you guys in master's programs? Yes, master's program. Thinking about doing a PhD? No? Okay. It'll be a while. Um, so part of the reason I entitled uh, my talk The Fire Festival is because um, even now, many years after I received my PhD, it felt like a scam. And when someone asked me if they, I think that they should go, get it, go on to get um, a doctorate, I usually say no, don't do it. Um, turn back. Um, you will be bamboozled, um, feel hustled, um, all the adjectives that John Rowley used to describe his um, involvement in the fire festival. Um, and it does sometimes feel that way, um, and it may be that way, but I think if you do want to go on to get a PhD, it should be something that you are doing because you really want to and or you really need to. Um, and I could go into why that is later, um, but I just kind of wanted to share some of my experiences on a road to a PhD in a life sciences program. So I know for some of you that I've talked to are um, in education, um, and this, the pathway for you might be very different. Um, some things overlap. Um, and um, really more of a just sort of how I've handled things and sort of some tips that I think have been helpful for me that aren't necessarily even related to just the PhD program or just being in STEM. So um, one other thing that I wanted to ask, for those of you who are in grad school, where did you go to undergrad? Well, I went to Syracuse University. Syracuse? Mm -hmm. I went to North Carolina a &T. North Carolina a &T. You went to Greensboro. Greensboro. Virginia State University. Virginia State. Okay, so we have some, where'd you go? I went to Howard. Howard, okay, so we got some HBCU alums in the house, okay. So, um, I will say, I'll just, this was already talked about, um, but this is sort of my path. I'm starting in uh, Atlanta, moving to Pittsburgh, and I'm originally from California, from San Diego. Um, I grew up thinking that I was from a very diverse place. 
uh, pediatrician was black, my dentist was black. Um, I didn't have very many black teachers, but I had a lot of non-white teachers um, growing up, and most of my friends were a, a, sort of a mix of folk. So it wasn't until I got to Atlanta that I was like, oh, San Diego is not very diverse. It was 7% black, about 25% uh, Hispanic, and to be right above the Mexican border is sort of impressive to have such a low number of um, Mexican population. Um, so I can sort of tell you uh, about my transition going to an HBCU, and it wasn't actually a cultural shock. The cultural shock came when I moved to Pittsburgh, um, sort of back into a more white space, um, and feeling sort of out, out of my element a little bit, um, and feeling like I was always having to explain myself to my peers. Um, when someone would ask me where I went to undergrad, and I would tell them Spelman, oh, I've never heard of that school before. Oh, well, I haven't heard of your school either. <laughs> so, I mean, here we are. Uh, we're confused. Um, and, or, you know, I was very involved in a uh, black graduate student organization when I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I found it immediately because I was like, I need to be connected to my people. Um, and some of my classmates asked me, well, why does this organization exist? You know, how would you feel if I was in a white student, graduate student organization. And I said, oh, you mean the student government? <laughs> here? Um, okay, so I always felt like I was being questioned and I felt alone and isolated a lot of the times and it made doing the work difficult. Um, and I, I, I think it's great that you, for those of you who are in graduate school, are in graduate school in a place where hopefully you're feeling nurtured um, and mentored and not feeling alone or feeling isolated, but it may feel like that when you go into the workplace maybe when you go to a conference. Um, the con my professional society, the Society for Neuroscience, when I was in graduate school, you could shoot a cannon at the conference, and there's 30,000 people that go to the conference every year. You could shoot a cannon and not hit a person of color, let alone a person who was also black. Um, and most of the black <coughs> students and faculty that I saw were oftentimes men. So I felt like a double minority. Um, it's gotten a lot better now. Um, I remember going to these conferences, and I be walking up and down the aisles of the convention, uh, Big Zip Hall, looking at posters. And when I would see someone who was black or brown, it was like I would just try to get closer to them. And maybe they'll notice me, and then we can be friends forever. And we'll see each other every time we come to this conference. And that's sort of how I approach my networking. You're black or you're brown, I'm black. We've got to be friends. We have to be connected to each other. And that's how I, I did grow a lot of my professional um, contacts, just because, not that I didn't feel comfortable interacting in other spaces, but it's just different when you're not always explaining yourself to someone. Um, and that made the transition much easier for me. Um, but I think sort of, the thing about graduate school is, even though I had supportive mentors, mentors who appreciated that I was, not that I was different, but that I had different struggles and that I had different things that I cared about, and they tried to make sure that they knew that I could come to them if I needed them. Um, and also, like, how can I help you do whatever it is that you need to do on top of the academic part? So I'm taking classes, I'm doing research. Seemingly, that should happen without, you know, outside biases, but research is research, right? We bring ourselves into the things that we do, be it in the classroom or in the work that we do, and we shouldn't have to separate ourselves. Um, so going from grad school to a postdoc, it was really important for me to figure out how I bring myself into the spaces that I go into. That I am not just Dr. Matthews with a neuroscience degree, but that I am Dr. Matthews, a black woman neuroscientist who has a breadth of experiences, interests um, outside of just my research, um, and that people respect that. Um, and I didn't know how to do that, but I wanted to do that. I was tired of always having to feel small in big spaces, or feel small in spaces where I was one of the only people that looked like me, um, and that it was okay to speak up about whatever it was. If I had an idea about how the dopamine system works in the brain, um, that I didn't feel like I had to shrink down because I didn't want to draw attention to myself. Or the opposite, when I was saying something about diversity or inclusion type of work, that I didn't feel like I had to shrink because I was afraid of what people would say. Like, oh, she always plays the race card, or she's always bringing this up. 
So it took some time to figure that out. And now that I'm at the NIH, um, I've transitioned from being a fellow to being a contractor for NIH. And we'll be switching back to being a federal employee, uh, hopefully in three weeks, um, <laughs> <laughs> working for another place at um, NIH. But um, NIH was the first time that I have walked into meetings, sat, literally sat at the table, and I was not the only person that looked like me. But there were other black women in the room, or other brown women um, in the room, um, not just male dominated, um, and that when I spoke, people listened um, and valued the things that I had to say. And that was really affirming, but it took to be in my 30s for that to happen. And sometimes that just can make you feel sort of like, well, I have all this education, I have all this greatness, I'm just a good person, people like me, I'm sometimes funny, um, I can relate to people, I like talking, and for the first time I felt like the things that I said, someone that wasn't my friend or my mom, or my dad, were like, yeah, that's, that's a good point, or that's a really interesting thing to say. So I've had a really good experience coming to NIH um, in terms of the work that I've been able to do um, I don't know if you caught anything that was in the bio, um, and I guess I didn't write the bio to be read, I, I, or to, to be heard, I, I wrote it to be read. Um, but essentially what I do at the NIH is I study people like you in this room, how you get to your career path, um, what happens when you're getting your education, um, being able to, to support programs that help, uh, particularly those who are studying the health sciences, um, not so much outside of that, not even really STEM education, unfortunately. Um, but who is doing research, who is getting into this, this career, and how do we provide other resources to get there? Um, so be it at, at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, if you're getting a master's, if you're getting a PhD, if you've already gotten a PhD and you're doing further research as a postdoctoral fellow, how can we help you get to the next level? Do you have the resources you need? Um, not just to do research, but do you have the resources to be a professional? Do you have enough uh, family leave time? you decide to start a family, or if someone in your family gets sick. Um, and oftentimes, strangely enough, there have not been policies in place to allow for someone receiving NIH funding to have time off to take care of the family, um, or even have enough money to live um, off of. So some, that's a lot of the things that I have worked on at NIH. And I will be going to the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Um, and that will focus more on programs to get more um, underrepresented minorities um, or uh, individuals from underrepresented groups into uh, having funding to be able to do research. So I'm trying to think of what else I really want to tell you guys. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about what's next, not just for me, um, but for anyone. So a lot of times when I was in grad school, and even an undergrad at Spelman, it was, well, what are we gonna do next? Like, what can I do with this degree? And it felt so, I don't know, being in science was a little different because, you know, if you wanna be a doctor, you go to med school. If you wanna be a lawyer, you go to law school. You like science, what do you do? Do you get a PhD? Do you become a teacher? Do you, like, what are the options? And it actually never felt like it was a laid out. So I thought a lot about how do I prepare myself the best for a degree or a profession that I don't even know I want. So how many in here are doing what they thought they would do, say, at the age of 15? So like freshman in high school. That's really impressive. Good job, guys, congratulations, that is amazing. Um, I was 28 years old when I figured out what I thought I wanted to do. I'm kind of doing it, <laughs> um, getting closer to things that I like, but I never really had a profession that I wanted. I just wanted to be great. That was sort of the, where I, I was. Dad went to college, went to Howard, that, um, Bison, very, very disappointed that I went to Spelman. Um, yeah, for those of you who are Howard alum, I feel like you all feel that way about any of your friends that did not go to Howard. Um, but I, so, but he was college educated, um, went to Howard Medical School, um, I didn't want to be a doctor because I didn't want to be like my dad, but I was really smart, straight A student um, in middle school and high school, did really well. But I wasn't one of those students who's like, well, I'm really smart, so I can go off and be a this, a 
aerospace engineer was like, well, I will go to college and I will study something that I like, probably hopefully you will in, and then I will get a job. Indiscriminate job, just J-O-B, that, that was the title of the job. And I will make money, I will find a husband, I will have kids, and I will live happily ever after. Um, and I, it mostly happened that way, except the husband and kids part, but <laughs> <laughs> on my 50 year plan. Um, but I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so, funny enough, my, like, what I do is helping people figure out what they want to do. Because I don't, it was really stressful for me not having a plan and not having someone to tell me like, well, you should at least work toward this. And even if the plan changes, at least you have something that you're working towards. And I never really was working towards anything until seriously the age of 28 years old when I applied for this. Um, well, I went on to Oregon to do a postdoc. Um, and it took me four years to get to where I thought I wanted to be. Um, but I do think about what's next and how I can be helpful to somebody. So if it's introducing you to someone who's doing the job that you want to do, or maybe you're interested in doing, you know, you're a teacher and you want to get your kids connected with whatever, making sure that you have the connections to make those things happen. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with that. And that's really mostly because I just was doing it because I was curious about like, well, what do we do next? How do we get there? Um, and I sort of made a career out of it. So I have no real advice on how to get to where you are on personal experience. It's really more like, don't do what I did. Um, that's what I told most of my mentees, and they're doing fabulous. Um, so it's really easy to do as I say, not as I do, or not as I did. Um, but those are things that I think about. What's next, not just professionally, but personally. How do you take care of yourself? How do you make sure that in a rigorous academic program or in a rigorous profession that you are able to take care of yourself first and then take care of the other things that are around you. So I'll sort of skip past some of this other stuff that I'm happy to talk about later um, if anyone is interested. But I, these are some of the things that I've already described. Um, and I don't think that these are exclusive to me as a black woman, but they really felt amplified. After I graduated with my PhD, um, I had insomnia for probably four months. I couldn't sleep past 4 a.m. It didn't matter what time I went to bed. Go to bed at 9 o'clock. Seems reasonable to get up at 4 o'clock. Maybe you only need seven hours of sleep. I can go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. I wake up at 4 o'clock every morning thinking about all the things that I didn't do in my PhD program or they gave me this PhD. I didn't really earn it. They just wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> and I almost thought about not going to my graduation because I didn't feel like I had earned it. So it took a whole year. I graduated, I defended in July. I graduated and I, I went to commencement in April. Um, but it took me a long time. And part of it is because of all of these things. And I had very supportive parents. I had a few um, friends who were also black women um, getting their PhDs um, in STEM. And I still struggled with thinking that I wasn't enough, that I was an imposter. Um, and that someone would find out that while I have a PhD, I have this degree, but I didn't really earn it. How do we figure it out? No idea. Uh, it, it didn't make sense, but that's how it felt. And so it crippled me in many ways. And it took a long time, a couple of years later, where I finally started going to therapy um, and working through some of the issues that I had, of con some control issues that I had, some other things. So feeling alone and isolated, um, and I think a lot of PhDs also experience this across racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds. Um, but I did feel like it was me. Like I'm, I'm the black student, so I, I, I'm probably the only one who feels like that. And I can't tell anybody that I feel this way because then they'll know, or then their suspicions about me being from the school they've never heard of was right. That I'm not really as smart as I think that I am. Um, not having the answers. Um, and I have answers and quotations because I don't know what questions I thought I was trying to answer. Um, but I didn't have the answers, not to my experiments, not to anything. And that was very frustrating, thinking that I needed these answers to these metaphys metaphysical sort of um, questions. Understanding coping with failure. Um, I think failure is seen as a bad thing. Um, and I thought it was a bad thing, that if you failed, my experiments failed, 
I didn't do well on a test, that that spoke directly to me as a person. Um, and I really had to redefine what failure meant um, and how to use failure. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but also asking for help is sort of coupled with this. There were a lot of things that I was struggling with. I was one of the only people in my lab, so I studied the brain, understanding how certain chemicals work in the brain when you're an adolescent. So many of you may know adolescents are more susceptible to psychiatric disorders, drug abuse, um, and we don't really understand why. So I, I wanted to study what was going on in the brain at that age. Um, and it required doing certain types of experiments, um, very meticulous, like literally doing brain surgery, not on humans. Um, and the techniques that I was using were very sensitive, and I was the only person in the lab doing it. Everybody else was doing a different hard technique. I was doing this hard technique that nobody else was doing. So when it failed, I didn't have anyone to say, well, hey, did you get this thing to work, or how do you do this? It was me all by myself. But instead of saying to my mentor, hey, I'm having an issue with this, I tried to troubleshoot everything on my own, try to constantly do things, um, figure it out for myself. Because again, I felt like I needed to have the answers of whatever that means, and I couldn't accept failure. Like, I, it can't be a failure, I have to figure this out. Um, and it was a waste of time, a, a huge waste of time for not asking for help um, and being vulnerable enough to say, like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm really struggling, I need somebody to, to help me out. I've really gotten better with this within the last year, so again, at this, this is all, these epiphanies didn't happen all at once, um, but I'm getting better at asking for help um, in any facet of life, um, and then giving myself permission to be authentically me, so not wearing big hoop earrings um, to lab, because I was like, again, I don't want to be the black girl, um, or listening to the music that I like, always feeling like I had to assimilate into whatever culture was with the people that I wanted instead of having them assimilate to me. Um, and it wasn't until sort of the end of my graduate career um, that I had students tell me that came into the lab like, it's so cool to have met you because you are just cool. And that's cool. Um, and while somewhat vague, it also really made me feel good that just someone seeing me be whatever they think that I am um, and seeming to be comfortable in that um, made a huge difference. So um, has anybody struggled with any of these things? Anybody still struggling with these things? Um, and we can, I'm happy to talk sort of about some anecdotal things and maybe how you um, overcome that or how you deal with it. Again, I don't think any of this necessarily ever goes away. Um, I heard someone say, a woman at a woman's luncheon that I attended um, at my last professional society conference, she said, if you don't feel like an imposter, you're probably not doing your work right. <laughs> Everybody is faking you. <laughs> we all <laughs> think that we know what we're doing. And that's okay to think that you know what you're doing. But when you get so confident that you think that your way is the only way, then that's when there's probably a disconnect. Um, and that was sort of affirming for me because while I feel like sometimes I'm just like doing my own thing, people think I have it together, like, oh, I wanna be like you, I wanna be like you, Dr. Matthews, when I grow up, and I'm like, aim higher. But then when I like look back over my CV, I read letters from students that I've talked to about the, thanking me for the advice I've given them, I'm like, I'm bad. Like, <laughs> I have been doing my thing for a while now. Um, and usually if you do it with confidence, you know what they say, like, just whatever it is that you're doing, do it with confidence, no one will even know. And it's true. No one knows that I've been fumbling my way through adulthood, in general, all these years. Um, but I've certainly found ways to make myself feel better about faking it. Um, and also in a way that I think is constructive and not destructive. I think we have a lot of other things to worry about in this world um, and being worried that we're not we don't know everything, we're not doing everything as elegantly as we should, it shouldn't be one of the things that weigh us down. So here are a few, I call them pro tips. Um, and certainly not necessarily to getting a PhD, there's things while I learned getting a PhD, um, but they certainly apply, I think, to any facet of life, um, just being awesome. And I think the most important thing, especially as you're figuring things out in terms of a career path, is defining what success looks like for you. Your definition of success should not necessarily look like the person sitting next to you. Um, it shouldn't look like the person who's three years ahead of you in your program. Um, 
and it doesn't even have to be more advanced or different than someone who's um, first starting out in the program. Um, you decide what success is. If success is getting a PhD, then get a PhD. Succeed in that. If entering a PhD program and leaving that PhD program because it is not fulfilling you and you are not getting what you want from it, that is not failure. That is saying, hey, this isn't for me, I need to move on to something else. And removing yourself from a situation that is not good is success. So building resilience, um, learning what failure is, um, and being comfortable with failure. Maybe it's a teaching moment, maybe you just really screwed up. Maybe you made a huge mistake. That is also fine. You can't learn, take it from a neuroscience, you cannot learn if you do not make mistakes, if you do not fail, if you do not face fear. Um, it's just impossible. Um, establishing relationships with good mentors. Um, how many of you here have a mentor? Okay, everybody in this room should be raising their hand. And the mentor doesn't have to be someone who is your academic advisor, someone who is looking over, checking off your schedule, helping you with research if you're doing research, or if you're in a master's program, have, helping you um, do your thesis. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. Hopefully you have one of those. Um, but I mean people who believe in you and are willing to help you with your goals. Whether or not they are in your same profession or not, whether or not they are at UDC, whether or not they are at your undergraduate institution, um, you should have people who want to help you and are in a position to help you, whether that's connecting you with somebody else, like, hey, oh, so you wanna be in this program or you wanna get a job working for Google, you have no tech experience, I'm gonna introduce you to somebody who works at Google who had no tech experience. That is someone who can be a mentor to you. Or this is what you need to do if you wanna break into this industry, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, or it could just be someone who supports you in your pursuits. Uh, but you should always have multiple mentors they can last you for a 10 minute coffee conversation. They can last you 10 years. But they should be people who are willing to help you. Um, and in, to some degree have some investment in you. So hopefully you're meet, meeting people who you can have relationships with long term. But even if it's somebody you email once a year, hey, just wanted to let you know, I got that scholarship you helped me with, thank you so much, this is what I'm doing. Um, as someone who is, has mentored, uh, students, I one of my mentees who's a PhD student, she's 40, um, so she's older than I am, um, but she is, um, I, I call her my daughter because I nag her, like, you need to send me this, you need to do this, you said you were gonna send me this, mind you, I have, she lives in New York, I live here, I have nothing to do with her program, but she said, I wanna do this, this, and this, and I said, okay, well, I'm gonna help you do this, this, and this, so you owe me assignments for us to get you from point A to point B. She doesn't send me her assignment, knock knock. And by knock knock, I mean text message. Um, you owe me something, I need you to send me that something. Okay, you owe me something. Okay, I'm gonna give it to you. What, what's my deadline? Deadline at the end of the year, January 1st. Uh, where's my assignment? I need that assignment. So I jokingly say that I'm her mom because I nagged her like my mother nagged me. But um, she, we, we aren't the same age, we're at different stages in our life, but she's at a, she's at a, a an earlier stage in her career than I am, and I said so we still have a working relationship. So it doesn't have to always be someone older than you, it doesn't even have to be someone, um, again, at your same institution, but it should be someone who is invested in you. Um, and ask them for what you want. If you need someone who's going to help you get your assignments turned in, or it's gonna be someone to help you get those chapters turned in for your dissertation, find someone who's going to do that. It could be a friend, it could be a peer mentor. You all in this room can mentor each other, and I know you've been talking about mentorship throughout the series, um, so you should constantly be building um, those relationships. Um, and that will help you become a better mentor, so you know what you want from someone else and how they can help you advance, and you can do the same for someone else. Um, and it's never too late. You can be a first year in a program, first year undergraduate. You can mentor your peers, you can mentor students who are in high school, et cetera. Um, be curious and be picky. Has anybody told you that you should apply to a school because of its rankings and that you shouldn't, I don't know, you should not want to go to Syracuse, New York because it's really cold? Or like, oh, that's a stupid reason not to go to a school. Um, a lot of people told me that my standards for um, programs were ridiculous because I did not want to go to X place. I didn't want to go to the Midwest. 
It's too cold in the Midwest. Um, and my dad even told me that he thought it was ridiculous that I wouldn't consider a school because I didn't want to be cold. Well, I would be miserable. How am I going to do well somewhere where I don't think that I will do well there? Um, I, so I think it's okay to be picky. It could be something like that. It could be, I really don't think I would get along with that professor, so I would rather not be in a situation where I'm beholden to them. Um, I think it's okay to make those decisions as long as you're making them for decisions that work well with your definition of success. What is going to help you succeed? And you should make all of your choices based on that definition. Um, but be open. So if that program is in North Dakota, but they have the best program, could you deal with the cold? Maybe. Um, think about it. Be open. Um, be open to trying new things. Um, and invest in yourself. Self-care, I know it seems like a buzzword, but it's true. Taking care of yourself. Um, has anyone flown on a plane before? At least once in their life? Um, I don't think the message has changed in the 30 plus years I've been on this earth. But the flight attendant always says that if the oxygen masks fall from the compartment, they tell you to put the mask on yourself first. And then help someone else. Be it a child, maybe someone who um, isn't able to, to do for themselves. And that's because you can't help anybody if you're dead. If you're not breathing, you can't help anybody. So if you are not well, you can't help anybody else. You can't do your work well. You can't be a good friend, a good child, a good parent, a good spouse, a good student, a good mentor, a good teacher, a good professional, if you are not well. Um, and that doesn't have to be you know, going on vacation every, you know, once a month, but it might be taking a trip to <clears throat> mind of getting manicure um, every other week. Uh, it could be going to the spa, or it could just be sitting at home watching the Fire Festival documentary on Netflix. It could be anything. Um, but you decide what that looks like for you, um, but make sure that your wellness is a priority. Um, and I guarantee that that will permeate into other, other aspects of your life. Um, but also investing in you can mean professionally. Coming to these sorts of things, meeting people, talking with people, finding out what skills you want to build, what skills you need to get to the next level, um, and maybe just sharpening the skills that you already have. I take a uh, emotional IQ workshop. I try to do that at least once a year. Um, also resume writing. I've submitted so many resumes. I probably could teach the workshop on resume writing, but I go to workshops anyway because things change. Careers change, hiring managers change, what they're looking for changes, and I want to be up on it so that if I were to come back here and give you all a resume uh, workshop, I'm not giving you a resume workshop from 1990. That is irrelevant. <laughs> the material doesn't matter. Um, so you want to keep sharp sharpening the skills that you have um, and thinking about ways that you're going to improve yourself, make yourself the best you, again, for whatever success is for you. If it's getting a job, um, in your field, getting tenured faculty, um, applying to a PhD program um, after you finish a master's program. Um, you should constantly be thinking of ways to improve yourself. So that's sort of my spiel. Um, I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you have, or even if you want to talk, sort of have, you know, get some feedback from other folks in the room of what you're going through, you know, we can workshop some things that you might be going through. Are you an undergrad here at UBC? Well, I'm actually doing my associate's degree first. Okay. So, um, is anybody here a uh, faculty that has a research lab? So, um, after I want you to talk to her. But, so, what kind of research do you want to do? Uh, anything with biomedical science. Anything with biomedical yeah. science? So, so, she's really the person you want to talk to. <laughs> so, I will give you some general advice in terms of going about that. Just ask, hey, there's, I'm sure there's a directory of folks um, at UDC or at Howard or at, what's across the street? American, uh, any of the universities that you can give yourself to physically. Um, look at their website, look at who's doing what kind of research, and then send them an email. Hi, Dr. So-and-so or Professor So-and-so, whatever their title is. <clears throat> and they have a PhD called Dr. Um, some people are weirdly attached to their titles. Um, and not weirdly, I shouldn't say that. I got my degree, I was afraid of it for a little while, and then it was like, no, you can call me Dr. Matthews. You can call me Marguerite, or you can call me Dr. Matthews. You won't call me Miss Matthews. So 
because I know you see this PhD at the end of my name. Um, so <laughs> you will send them an email saying, um, good afternoon or good morning, Dr. So-and-so. Um, I see that you do research on aging in mice um, that have nicotine use. I think this is really interesting, whether you think it's interesting or not. But if it's interesting enough for you to want to do research in that lab, I think this is interesting. Would you mind if we had a chance to talk about a research experience? Most researchers are happy to one, talk about their research, and two, if they have an opportunity, even if it's volunteer work, especially if they don't have to pay you, to let you in their lab and help them do their work. Because most professors, at big universities anyway, don't, a lot of times don't do the research on their own. They need other people working for them. So they're oftentimes, not always, very happy to have someone come in and do work on a project. <clears throat> and it can start off something simple where you're just maybe shadowing somebody, but it could turn into a bigger project. Um, but just ask. Never be afraid to ask. Um, and go meet with somebody. Hey, can I come to your office and talk with you about such and such? If you know a grad student or someone who's doing research in a lab, ask them, hey, are there any opportunities in your lab to do some research? Um, and sometimes cold calls really do work. You don't have to be in a program. You don't necessarily have to have your bachelor's yet. Right where you are, you can already start. You already know at least one person that's physically here that you can talk to today about um, opportunities with her. Um, and she probably knows other faculty at UBC or elsewhere who might actually be looking for someone like, hey, I'm really looking for a lab tech who can do X, Y, Z, um, send me their resume or you know, send me their names. So just don't be afraid to ask. networking system for undergrads coming from HBCU where um, a PhD program is allotted for uh, neuroscience, particularly of the medical, which I would like to be, I aspire to be a um, orthomolecular psychiatrist, mm -hmm. not psych psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, our program here at UBC supports the clinical mm -hmm. uh, psychotherapy, but I'm headed in the other direction. So do you have any known direction, pointer, people? So I will say I don't know a lot about <coughs> non-traditional students, um, at least in this area. When I lived in Portland, I did a lot of work um, with the Portland State University, which had a lot of commuter students. They called them commuter students, but mostly students who um, did not come straight from high school. So I don't know a lot about programs here, but and I don't say this to be dismissive. Google exactly what it is that you're looking for in terms of scholarships. There are, a t I know of a ton of scholarships, at least certainly in Portland, um, some of them were local, but there are a lot of states um, have opportunities for um, non-traditional students or students who are black and brown. Um, I don't know so much about this area, just I haven't gotten as, um, I'm not as aware just because I don't have as, I'm not as, uh, I don't work as directly with uh, ac academic institutions here um, as I did um, previously, but I'm positive that there are things out there. And if it's a question of maybe talking to um, somebody that you know that's faculty here or an academic advisor to try to see if you can create an application that's going to be strong and you know receive the funding. So I'm sure it's, it can be difficult. The financial burden of education is hard for everybody. Um, for probably certainly people who have lived a life and have you know possibly other things going on that where they're not just in school you know um, all the time. Um, that's how I went to school. I was in school all the time. I was on work study. Um, so to your second question, we can definitely talk afterwards. Um, but because I don't know much about programs specifically for the thing that you're looking for, but I'm certainly happy to connect with you afterwards so we can talk about ways that we can sort of come up with a plan for going for that. Um, and also thank you for being here and asking those questions. Um, again, asking for help. Um, sometimes it just, you know,
you know, puts it out there and hopefully if there's anybody else who's maybe thinking along the same lines can connect with you and um, brainstorm. Does anybody know, is anybody else here a non-traditional student? Do you know of any um, types of scholarships or financial um, opportunities that she could take advantage of? Like, do you work full time? I work full time and I go to school full time. And let's just talk after this. Yeah. Let's exchange it. Have you heard about the Herb Block Scholarship? Are you, are you a four year or two year? Four year. <laughs> Are they not, have, do you not qualify? Or I don't qualify. Okay. Um, mostly scholarships that unfortunately link to our institution are for um, not of my age, right? Right, okay. Or of my year of tenure, or they have been already exhausted. Okay. So. Okay. Well, yeah, hopefully she will be a, another good resource for you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, concerns? Is there anything that someone's struggling with that they just need another year to hear about? I'm glad that you mentioned about um, therapy because I was at, I'm not saying it's most of brag, but I was at everything. And then life happened. Oh, yeah. And I found it. So I was there. So I went from being just on the road to flunky. Well, almost flunky now. But I was like, but I encourage anyone who has a life circumstance that happens to speak. And I, I always didn't understand, and I say this aloud, in psychology, our gatekeepers say, as psychology, is we aspire to be healers. We need 